color of your skin? Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. No, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate? You should ask yourself, who taught you to hate being what God gave you? Most of us blacks, or Negroes as he called us, really thought we were free without being aware that in our subconscious, all those chains we thought had been struck off were still there. And there were many ways where what really motivated us, motivated us was our desire to be loved by the white man. Malcolm meant to lance that sense of inferiority. He knew it would be painful. He knew that people could kill you because of it, but he dared to take that risk. He was saying something over and above that of any other leader of that day. While the other leaders were begging for entry into the house of their oppressor, he was telling you to, you build. to build your own house. History is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. History tells of people where they have been and what they have been, where they are and what they are. Most important, history tells a people where they still must go, what they still must be. The relationship of history to the people is the same as the relationship of a mother to her child. As you see, uh, we're talking about Dr. John Henry Clark, a legend. I mean, truly a, a man uh, before his times, born in 1915, and really shows how to live and survive being black in America. And it's my honor, really, to have uh, Mrs. Sybil Clark, Sybil Williams Clark, here today with us. And, of course, uh, Booker T. Coleman, or Kawa Hawawatha. Come in. Come in. Come in. Excuse me. <laughs> My brother. Uh, but it, it's, it's interesting. I just watched this film again, and it's, it's such a thrill to have you here today to discuss this, this giant of a man. I mean, this is it's overwhelming watching this film and being close to people that really knew him as well as the two of you. I mean, he's close to your father in age, and uh, naturally you were married to him all those, what, 12, 13 years? Well, uh, you were with him that many years and, and had the, the pleasure of being uh, close to this genius. You were just telling us that, that that film took four days to do and he was blind at the time. He had a photographic memory and uh, he's one of a kind, self-taught, hmm? truly a son of a sharecropper, all these accolades. Tell us a, a little bit about what it was like being close to such a giant. Well, if you begin at the beginning, I came from the little, I call it the Coconut Island of Jamaica. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. And um, when I came, I met people who had been friends of his, and he was then lecturing at the County Cullen Library, mm -hmm. he and Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanov. Ah, Dr. Ben. And in those days, 
both of them were not known or well known, mm -hmm. but only to a few people, friends mostly. And they would meet in this little space on 136th Street. And those days you paid maybe a quarter to get in. We're talking 40s? Yeah. 30s or no, 40s? In the, in, the, in the early 50s. Early 50s, okay. In the early 50s. Okay. Or maybe, well, I came here in 1947. Okay. I met John in 1949. Okay. And um, the people that he uh, worked with and were friends with were his lifelong friends mm. to the end. And, um, and one person in particular, uh, Mrs. Alberta Lewis, they were both at the Y, I think the YMCA. Was a school teacher, right? No, no. Better. It was a YMCA, mm -hmm. and um, she then, they then had what you call the Harlem Thinkers. It was a young group of people from all over, but mostly mm -hmm. from the city, and they would meet and discuss and have book, you know, readings. And from this person, all through those years, until on the, um, he wrote the Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust. And um, he was blind at the time, mm. but he dedicated that book to her. That is the kind of person, he never forgot his friends, yes. all through the years. And he had a, a value on human life at whatever stage you may have been. Mm. You didn't have to be in academia. You didn't have to be a professional. You just had to be a fellow human being. Yes, yes. That is what distinguishes him even until today. Even until today. That res it, it renovate wherever you go mm. in the world or in America or wherever you are. There is some person who will come up to me and said, I knew your husband. He changed my life. Yes, yes, very much so. That's fabulous. Well, I'm, uh, he, I definitely changed your life, more or less. He was your guide throughout your life. No doubt, he? no doubt. And probably a lot of what has led me to what I do in terms mm -hmm. of the Board of Education. And you're a teacher, too. Go ahead. As, as a teacher, as right. a teacher of culture and social studies, and as your opening quote spoke of, uh, history. Mm. Uh, that's a quote that I often <coughs> use also. And Actually. that has been ingrained in my mind in terms of the role that history plays and understanding right. who you are. Because I had the um, honor of meeting Professor Clark when I was young, 12 and a half. I, w I was brought up to Harlem by a group of what we call old heads. They would become, they were part of what would become the Black Panther Party in New York. Mm. These were the conscious brothers and sisters that would uh, take a group of young brothers. And like I say, I grew up down the block here in Amsterdam houses. Mm -hmm. And they would take us up to Harlem, or they would take us on their bikes, or they would take us down on Western Avenue. There was, a, there, there, there was an old bread store that in, in those days, at the end of the day, if they didn't sell their bread, they would either give it away or throw it away. Mm -hmm. And so they used to get, uh, these old heads would get sticks of butter, and they would take us down, we'd get a drink and get the bread, and we'd sit on the docks down on West End, and they would just talk to us and mm -hmm. teach us about culture. Well, one of these activities that they took us was to take us to Harlem to sit before Professor Clark. Mm. And uh, that was my first meeting with him. I was 12 and a half. Uh, it, it was 1966. I was at the end of my seventh grade. And the reason why I tell this story and, and what has made me be here is, as Elder Sybil has said, he changed my life. Mm -hmm. uh, he gave me what he often said he wanted to give us was self-concept, right. a sense right. of self. Right. And as I work with our children in the Board of Education, I'm celebrating now 26 years in New York uh, teaching. One of the things that I noticed that our people, that our children do not have, that our families sometimes do not give them, because maybe they have not been given, is a sense of self-concept. Mm -hmm. And that is what Professor Clark gave me. He gave mm -hmm. me a sense of self-concept from a child's mm -hmm. perspective, right. so that my role in life has been to do for others what he did for me. Because I used to always say to him, you know, that there's no way I could ever repay him. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no monetary value. It's, it's a priceless experience to have someone change you. And he used to say, well, your role is not to pay me back. Your role mm -hmm. is, to, is to do for others what I did for you. And um, I remember this summer we honored Professor Clark. And I remember one of the things that I heard El Elder Sybil constantly tell other people is that, yes, you should financially support those that have come, like Dr. Ben and others. You should definitely uh, uh, let them know that you're there, let them know that, but you've got to carry on their work. Mm -hmm. That's, That's the key. It. 
you got to carry on the work, and that is what we have attempted to do in honor of Professor Clark, because that's the only way that I could possibly honor him, to let him know that he is so valuable to us, that his work must continue, mm. and it must continue through all of our young people. We might mention that tonight at uh, a Berry Center, 127th Street? Mm -hmm. 127, 127 West 127. 127 West 127. Uh, Dr. Ben, we're honoring Dr. Ben at 7 o'clock mm -hmm. uh, there tonight. So he'll be speaking. Mm -hmm. saying, I started to do an interview and bring it to us today, but I didn't get a chance to. Because he's, he's back and uh, he's, a, he's a fighter. You know, uh, I think I did one of the first interviews of him uh, after John died, Dr. Clark died. And because he, he was, he almost died right along with him, didn't he? It's funny how people, not funny, but it's, it's, um, what word would you use? It's profound or, or it's just, it's kind of sp spooky the way uh, uh, all this stuff comes out. I mean, you know in your heart, when you, you meet powerful people. I mean, you can feel the vibes, the vibration is there. And the first time I got around all this energy was at the at, at Abyssinian Baptist Church. I'm sitting next to, uh, 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 what's it called, what's his name? Yeah. Gil Noble. And I'm, I've got my little VHS camera. I must have been my second year here at m and I felt so honored. I was around all these, <laughs> all these giants. And then I finally, I knew about Dr. Clark, but I didn't know him half as well as uh, anybody else. I, I didn't see the film at the time, and I was, I was so in awe. But I knew Professor Small, I knew uh, uh, Jeffries, uh, and... Um, you were a greenhorn. I, I, would, I really was. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was so green, and I was just, I mean, I was in awe. I, that's, that's the word. I was in awe of everything. I just, wow. And the, the, oh, and it was just, I felt so stupid, really, that I yeah. didn't know. <laughs> I really well, did. I said, well, how could I miss something like this? Yeah. I mean, people today, when they see, uh, uh, you have to see this film, The Great and Mighty Walk. We're going to show little clips of it so you get a good idea. It's made by Wesley Snipes. You saw the opening, uh, which was the beginning of the film. And... Um, the history of Dr. Clark is really a, um, the son of a sharecropper, and we're just going to go a little bit over his early beginnings, how he was raised, and we're going to talk about family and what's so important to us as a race of people. To understand where do you, you, you have this knowledge of yourself, but uh, here you find a man born in 1915 in Alabama, and you can imagine what that was like, and self-teaching himself. But his real beginnings came towards to him because of the love of his family and the beautiful women he had around him, <laughs> as Mrs. Clark is a uh, testament to that. Well, let's go back to this uh, beginning. Before, the, the, the we, before we proceed, okay. um, we're talking about this impact he had on the students. Well, mm -hmm. I was at a dinner just last night, mm -hmm. and I met a young woman from Brazil. She's got a PhD in cultural affairs, and she told me, I knew your husband. I met him, I read his books. I was at the Sorbonne. Mm -hmm. I had it not been for what he told me, I would not have made it through. So she got enough self-esteem right. from right. meeting him. And you, you get this all wherever you go. There is always somebody in the crowd will mm. come up to you and say, he changed my life. Now this he is because of all the lies that you're taught in the European schools or the oppressors schools, uh, which Dr. Clark expressed so, so um, amply. Uh, uh, what is it that they teach us? They don't teach us our history. They lie to us about our history. Well, in, 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 so this is what helped the woman. But unlike most of the, um, the historians, and I don't think most people know this, that this man had traveled mm. in every country in Africa except South Africa. Except South Africa. Except Af South okay. Africa. And in his, in the, in the latter days, he was invited to South Africa by three different groups. And he told them all, until you get the land you are not free, and right. I am not coming. 
Bye. and he did not go. Bye. Bye. But he was an international person who had been all over the world, mm. including what we now call the Middle East, right. had met Saddam in the early years, okay. was in an international organization to improve race relationships so that he was out there trying to cement this global thing. But his thing was that unless, unless we tell the history ourselves, it will never be told. That's right. Because That's the right. lies are still being repeated right. on cable, what they call Discovery, mm -hmm. the History Channel. I look at it, yeah. and it's and unbelievable. So unless we get our children to understand that this is a part of their lives, past or present, because we now have people claiming cradle of civilization in a part of the world that didn't exist with, when before. You're after talking about Egypt. Iraq. We're talking about Iraq or no going to have heard it. Right. That they are the cradle of civilization. Mm -hmm. And chronologically, you can't be when Egypt was before you. Right. And then you, we have still have the, the, the monuments, and we have the history, mm -hmm. and we have the writings. Because remember, we were told we had no writings. Right. But yet, we're looking on all these airports, and we're using symbols to tell us where we are. Mm. So who had the language first? Well, you know, it's so important that we really understand history. Because, I mean, I, would, I grew up in the 50s, and I was brainwashed by the Ten Commandments. And I still couldn't understand how nobody had a suntan. I said, I know it's sunny out there. <laughs> I say this often. I'm sure you heard it out there before. But uh, I could never understand why uh, there wasn't more told. I mean, I, I used to love history. But I didn't see anything in our books that went before Greece. Greece was the beginning of civilization to Europeans. I mean, Still. what you had before that they never talked about. So then when I got into ancient Egyptian history, and I realized that, like Dr. Clark, um, 10,000 B.C. when we were building pyramids, the European was in the cave. We were building pyramids by the stars, and the European didn't, didn't thought the, the world was flat until 1492. Mm -hmm. I mean, what lies have we been told in school? What have we been taught? And they're still hiding it from us. All right. And you see, one of the great things about Professor Clark, <clears throat> in terms of his teaching, is that there, you know, as you know, as a teacher, we see that there is content and there's intent. Mm -hmm. Content is is what you teach. Intent is the method by which you teach it. Okay. Professor Clark, there are there are teachers that have a great deal of content but a weak intent. They have a lot of knowledge, but their methodology of teaching it doesn't get across. Mm -hmm. There are others that have a very little bit of content but have a wonderful methodology. So the little that they do know can get across. Professor Clark happened to be one of those unique human beings that has been a, amongst us that had a, a, a huge content and a most wonderful intent. Mm -hmm. He had a way of teaching you that could place you within the confines. He could take, like I know Professor Smalls always tells the story about when he first learned about Shaka Zulu. Mm. And Professor ah, Clark was okay. talking about Chaka Zulu, yeah, and Professor yeah. Smalls talks about him literally feeling like he was in the right. room with Chaka right. Zulu, right. <laughs> as Professor Clark would go through this right. methodology. Later on, I remember I attended a lecture by Professor Clark, and there were very few lectures that I didn't try to get there, sit in the back and listen to him mm -hmm. when he was at Hunter College, and when he would go to different places, I would be there to listen to him. There came a point in my career that I no longer listened to what he said. Mm -hmm. I watched how he taught. And there was one time he came to me and he said, you know, Booker T, I noticed that uh, you didn't hear a word I said. <laughs> he said, but I know you watched what I, how I did it. Because his methodology was what he called talking in a circle. Mm -hmm. And in talking in a circle, teaching mm. methodology means that you can have a musician in the room, you can have a sports person in the room, you can have someone who's very good in math or science, you can have someone who's in a lot of different areas. A lot of times teachers will go into a room and teach from their perspective. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in a room of 30 people, if you focus more on the historical aspect of something, you'll, you'll lose the musician and the sports person mm -hmm. and the mathematician. You'll lose them because you're coming from your perspective. But what Professor Clark, he was so rich in his knowledge and his base of, of information, he could take, for instance, like Shaka Zulu, and he could talk about music. Mm -hmm. And he could tie music to Shaka Zulu. So then he would pick up the wow. musician mm. student. Then okay. he'd say, and then whenever he was talking in a circle, it's, it's called topic-centered and topic-associated in teaching. Okay. You, you have a point that you want to make. 
Right. But you go off the point to your topic association. Mm -hmm. And what he would do is he would get off the point and he would start talking about music. Mm -hmm. He'd talk about the music of Azania or South Africa. He'd talk about how the, how the Azanians, how the Zulu would practice warfare according to a particular drum beat. Ah. And then he'd bring that musician into that conversation and then he'd say, okay, now. Every time he said, okay, now, that meant that he was going to draw that person back into the center. Mm -hmm. He'd get back on point and continue talking about Chaka Zulu. Then he'd go out there and he'd see that he had a basketball player in there. Mm -hmm. And then he'd talk about the, the, the physical athletics that Chaka would put his people through. Mm -hmm. Then that person that was kinetically, uh, uh, kinesthetically involved would then start to listen because that's his strength. Right, and right. he's out on the circle. Then he'd say, okay, now. At that point, he would pull that person in. So now he's got the musician and the sports person. Mm -hmm. Make a long story short, Professor Clark in one lesson could go around a room and get a sense of everybody's interests. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the class, everybody would be on point with him. Everybody's on point. No that, matter what your background was. That made him a master teacher. That's yes. a master teacher. That's he called it talking teacher. in a circle. Talking, talking in a circle, circle. yes. Well, you want to go back and watch a little bit of the early beginnings so we can get the people to have a classic exposure to what it's like to be str struggling uh, in America in 1915, imagine. I'll play the role in from uh, VTR 2. Describe a legend, an African-American hero, an historian, an activist, who for half a century has charted a singular course dedicated to the intellectual and spiritual liberation of a people. Though his eyes are now darkened by glaucoma, he continues to enlighten the lives of thousands of men and women through the pages of his many books and in university classrooms across the country. How do you describe a legend? You can't, really. But you can meet the men and women who influenced him. You can learn from him the hidden history of the African people learn from him a different way of making sense of this complex and often very confusing world. And you can let Dr. John Henry Clark tell his own extraordinary story in his own soulful style. on uh, Sharecropper Farm in Union Springs, Alabama, New Year's Day, 1915. That was a great feast day in our family. And because my mother was a favorite in the family and I was late arriving, she said that nothing would be killed in this family until my child is born. And I didn't arrive until three, and everybody was hungry. The feast had not started, and I wasn't exactly welcome. <laughs> they never quite forgave me for that, holding up the feast. My early schooling was in a uh, one-room schoolhouse that was called Miller's Hill School. When we moved slightly out of the city, I was chosen to go to city school. Officially, I never finished high school in the formal sense until later years. In fact, I taught two generations before I took time out to get my BA, my master's, and my PhD. Now, I have it all now, but uh, I'm principally self-trained my university was the public library and well-chosen second-hand bookstores. So while I grew up poor, I grew up in a very rich environment, culturally rich. I grew up with a whole lot of love and affection, a lot of lap time, a lot of slap time, too, because I wasn't permitted to get away with too much. Thank you. 
Miss Evelina Taylor is my fifth grade teacher, and she might be the foundation teacher in my life. In addition to teaching me basic good thinking and good conduct, she called me into her room during her lunch hour one day and told me to stop playing the fool because I was playing the fool just to get accepted. And she said, it is better to be right and march into hell than to follow a bunch of fools into heaven. I wanted to do something to impress Miss Taylor. And we had curry events on Friday. We wanted to say something unusual because I worked for white people before and after school and they had magazines. They would receive them one day, read them hurriedly up, throw them away the next day. So when I got up for current events, I always had something decidedly different to say about my own people and about other people. No, I wanted to do something real, real big. So I went to a lawyer that uh, I worked for before and after school. I can still remember his name, Gag Steider. And I asked him for a book about my people in early world history. He says, I'm sorry, John, that uh, you came from a people that have no history. My mind would not accept that. I continued to search, and I opened a book called The New Negro, and I opened to an essay called The Negro Digs Up His Past. And for the first time, I knew that I came from a very old people, that we were older than slavery, older than oppression, older than Europe. Now the scramble began for more information. Fascinating. How does it feel to watch that? It's, it's, it's the, the contrast of that is we're talking about that period of time. Mm -hmm. I have a grand niece who's now going to high school mm -hmm. in Columbia, South Carolina. Mm. And she brought a book that's reading material for the class. Mm -hmm. For the class. Mm -hmm. All right. And we're saying that China discovered America in 1496. The, the you, do you hear what I'm talking about? <laughs> China discovered America in 1496. A book that's given to the children, this is, this is what they have in the class. So we're going backwards. Precisely. So the fight is on, and not the fight, but the war is on for our minds. Mm. And not only mine, but our land, which is now Africa. Right. And unless we continue this fight, our children will be lost. So our kids today are back to the, to the early right. beginnings of Dr. Clark. That's Clark. right. This today. Today. So this summer, she was, in, she was here for the summer. She showed mm. me the book because I gave her some books to read. So I was this re is required reading in the high school she's going in Columbia, South Carolina. Believe it or not. Well, That's unreal. Well, let's come up to New York. Yeah. The oh, social yeah. studies oh. book that they're using in New York City, um, while I may not quote an African-American um, piece, I can quote a Native American piece that will give a, 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 an Abenaki a creation myth. And underneath it, it will say, these people believe this is how they came into existence. Mm -hmm. You see, the way in which they do it is very subtle. Mm -hmm. And the way in which they will uh, deal with the children's mind, you see, well, what, what we are experiencing in the Board of Education today, mm -hmm. despite what you will see on TV from those who are in charge, we are worse off now than we've ever been before. The bottom line that we're looking at and what Professor Clark's struggle was and the struggle that many educators who have, 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 have respected his struggle and continue his struggle is the reality that in the mid-80s, there were some good things happening in education. Mm -hmm. 
under the guidance of Dr. Richard Green, mm -hmm. who lived right here on the corner on the Alfred on 61st. That's from my old high school. The, the chancellor. The chancellor. He, from, he oh, died. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, now, again, I'm going to leave that other to the side. He okay. died. Let's just come to that grips because I have questions about that, but that's another discussion altogether. Uh, he was implementing certain programs. At that point, those folk in charge decided that could not continue. And they put in place a plan that took them from around 1987, 88 until this present time to an act. And the bottom line that we're experiencing in our educational system as, as I relate to our children is our children are absolutely brilliant. Make no mistake about it, they are brilliant. They are more brilliant in a sense of all the things that are in front of them Mm -hmm. than past generations, as it should be. Everyone should do better than the one before. That's natural. But the bottom line is the power that our people have, if we ever were to go and become the John Henry Clarks and the Sharshi McIntyres, if we ever were to be the uh, Sybil Williams Clarks and all the others that stand up and teach and learn, we would revolutionize the world. We would do in education what Michael Jordan did in basketball and mm. Tiger Woods did in golf and the Williams sisters do in tennis. We would change the structure of it. Therefore, they couldn't co-opt it because they wouldn't know it. They can't play the Williams sisters because they play a game that others don't play. It's very difficult to play someone that has taken the game to another level, a level that you yourself are not intrinsically and extrinsically capable of dealing with. And that is what they saw in our children during the 80s. They saw that if this cultural peace were enacted, if our children got a self-concept of who they were, mm -hmm. where they came from, who they were, where in the world are they and how in the world did they get here, if they could answer those questions, they would revolutionize the world and their children would not be able to do what our children could do. And that was what they put on. So it's happening all over because they understand black power. Mm. And the power of the black man is to understand his own spirituality. Deep. You can't touch it. Mm. That which you cannot understand, that which you cannot touch, you have to make it either that it doesn't exist or that it's wrong. So that you make them not want to touch it. See, when Professor Clark touched my life, he revolutionized. You see, that's what uh, Gil Scott Heron meant when he said that, that the revolution wouldn't be televised. Mm. Because you see, what you see happening on the streets is not the revolution, it's the result of the revolution because the first revolution, the most important revolution, occurs in the mind. Right, right, right. And that's what exactly. Professor Clark did for all those whom he touched. Mm. He revolutionized our mind. He changed the structure of our thinking. Therefore, when he touched, when he changed that, nobody could touch anything else. Mm. And that's what I will always respect and love that elder, that ancestor for. See, that's what I felt when I went into Abyssinian Baptist Church, the spirituality. I didn't, couldn't find a word for it, but it was the spirit. Not the vibration, but the, really the spirit. He was His there. Spirit. But you want to know where he there. really was. He was out on the street. Because <laughs> yeah. I had to leave the church. Because I had to go back out on the street where those drums were playing. Because you see, that's where Professor Clark was oh, also. Because okay. remember the festivity out on the street? They closed right, up right, on right, 37th right, Street. Right, 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 right. Because when the people, some of the people couldn't get into the church. Right. For whatever, one right. reason or another. It was too crowded. It, it was too <laughs> yeah. crowded. And you see, <laughs> the, the, the chosen people would go into the church. <laughs> oh. But you see, it was the masses of the people who he well, changed. Right. That was the key. The masses of our people who so endeared and loved that brother, who would go to the lectures, who would speak to him in the church. Uh, uh, who would go up to the restaurant um, uh, on, a, on 140 uh, Fifth Street, reliable restaurant where we mm -hmm. saw him eat so many times, or to the hot pot where he would eat. You know, you know, this brother mm -hmm. revolutionized my mind. We used to talk about how to fry potatoes. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, we used to talk about tomatoes and okra, which he loved so much. Oh, we used yeah. to talk about how to cook that. <laughs> he, he, we could talk about anything. And when I would call him up, he'd say, hey, man, how you doing? I can still hear him say, hey, man, how you doing? He was a regular, regular person, right? He was a master. He was a master. He was a human being. Right. And in, in uh, what we're talking about, um, his niece, who also teaches in Dublin, um, Georgia, she went to a teacher's conference in California and heard a young man lecturing. And she said it reminded her of Uncle Bubba. Uncle Bubba. Uncle Bubba, Bubba. right. They call and him she Bubba. went up to him and asked him, where did you learn your history? From Dr. John Henry Clark. Ah, wow. He tells of a story in going into Midwestern University 
town to speak, and a student came up to him, who was a, a doctor came up to him, who was then told him he was a student of his, and he was then the director of the gynecological department mm -hmm. in the um, in the hospital, all because of what he taught him. In other words. Being, just coming out of his class didn't say that you were just a student who learned the rhetoric. You mm -hmm. learned the practical way of living, how to apply what was given to you, and to then so go out and serve your people. Amen. That was the kind of education. Not yeah. that you took it right. to make money right. Right. or to get a better job, but to be the master in your own house, right. to control your own life to the extent that you can make a difference then you make it in a community and among your own people. This is what we now have to tell our children mm. who have come into this legacy that was created for them that they don't know anything about because it's been taken from them. But then we have a hip hop generation right. who is a few of them may be aware. Country. But look at all that energy. Look at all that money that we could use going into building institutions instead of putting it in the gold mines of South Africa where the gold is stolen. You're being, people are being killed every day to mine that gold and you're putting it around your neck to make sure that you're Bling a bone. part of the, the scene. It is, it's, it's incredible. We have what we can do to make a difference, but then we have to make that difference felt and let them understand that it was given to them, not for them to squander, not for them to share and say everybody's alike, because the people that they're sharing with will eventually take it and say they created it, like they have done to jazz, and now they're doing to the above right, too. Right, right. So right. unless they understand- A rock and roll. Understand what it is all about. It's a matter of taking what you have created and getting it in somebody else who's actually stealing it, but you don't know because you think they're there to share it with you. That's not the way the world mm. works. Somehow we've got to make them understand this is the real world, and the real world is what you create belongs to your community. You can share it, yes, but make sure that it does the best for you than for somebody else. Mm. One of the main reasons why uh, you know, we chose to, to bring Dr. Clark to the people, because I think one of the most profound things I, I found in this piece was his, his reference to family and how yes. you, he related to family as, you, as you're talking about how, uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember when, you know, any person in the community would uh, grab you by the collar if you were doing something wrong and spank you, take you home to your mother. <laughs> and so, hey, you, your boy is out there doing, on, and you get the second spanking from your mother because, you know, that sort of thing existed amongst black people. But you don't see that happening today. I think that's why the kids are so, off, off uh, wherever they're going. But then within, within our lifetime, we have seen the destruction of that structure of a family right. with drugs. So that's, that'll important. do it. Now we have AIDS before us, and now we have gender, what do you call it? Don't forget about gender? alcohol. <laughs> Don't forget yeah, about we alcohol. We're losing our children based on gender preference. Mm -hmm. This is another uh, thing that okay. we have. Right. But that and, was always uh, there. It's been always there, but it was not something that was prevalent or seeking. Well, people are prouder, prouder of it, it now. Because you, I don't, you know, maybe th you have to respect people and what their yeah. choices are because this is what it is. But somehow the proliferation of this behavior mm and being pitted, uh, you have to see it to understand what it is. Mm -hmm. Because children who are growing up in a normal situation mm -hmm. understand that there's a difference between a male and a female. Of All course. right, let, let's go back to the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ben teaches, Dr. Right. Clark taught us that mm -hmm. in that society at, a certain, at the age of puberty, mm -hmm. a young boy is taken out into the woods and then circumcised. And then he understands the Is role that when he of a yeah, that's right. Oh, and wow. they do the same okay. thing to the female. Then they will put them together in close relationship where they're excitable, mm -hmm. but they can't touch each other. And that is control. Sexual control mm. and a behavior and a respect between and a difference between the gender. 
We have lost that. We don't have that. We don't have that. Well, that's by design. All right. And then you cannot create a nation of people and you're not having children. Right. You're not really right. not rebuilding. Right. Right. And then to tell me that you can have children, because the, the, the phenomenon now is that two females can then go together, but they can mm. get in virtu- they can then yeah, choose a child, mm. and then one person will go through the process. If that is not screwed, you've got to tell me what it is. Mm. I don't know the truth. I grew up in a house with six brothers, mm-hmm. a father and a mother. Yeah. So maybe that's, maybe that's why I can't comprehend. <laughs> yeah. I can't. I just can't. Well. And then I have them in my family too. Gays? Uh, oh yes. Oh okay. Not no lesbians. Mm. Not okay. gays, lesbians. All right. It has not touched the male in our family, but it has touched the female in the family. And in every instance, these children have gone to white universities. Hmm. You know, uh, there's a difference in that too. Because I remember in the old days we had the jewel box review, and it was quite, quite, yeah. quite entertaining. Uh, we had the uh, drag queens at the uh, Rockland Palace yeah. every year. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. The, but the these gay are, ball. These are, these are people with great deal of love, a mm-hmm. great deal of intelligence, a great deal of warmth. And you can't. You have to love them because they're a part of you. Okay. You don't separate all them. Right. But all I'm saying is that something is has gone awry, okay. where we are now instead of creating what we call the you know the family right. to the extension and then the procreation and then the continuation of the family, how are we going to create? How are we going to take this if this is what we have? Because you are fine if the other people want to do it. That's their that's their thing. Okay. Yeah, but it's not, I'm telling you, based on what I know and what I've been taught by these two great teachers mm-hmm. and their experience and that culture, and it's not only a part of, um, it's not only a part of one part of Africa, it's all of Africa. Okay. And what they also said in that situation is that that behavior which was introduced by the Arabs who came in. Okay. All right. All right. No, right. this is what I was told. Now, in the African culture, that, this right? doesn't, the it's culture. not tolerated, right? It's not tolerated. Well, from, from when the research that we have seen, there is no place for it. Okay. By right. matter of degree, nature always has it that people will, you know, you create male and female. By, by nature, you will always have those that are in between mm-hmm. in terms of choices and feelings. But mm-hmm. within the African society itself, as Elder Clark was speaking of the rite of passage and circumcision mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. excision, that actually occurred because the, um, the male uh, reproductive organ has as the foreskin somewhat mm-hmm. of a semblance of a female reproductive organ. And okay. the clitoris on a female is somewhat of a male reproductive mm-hmm. organ. Okay. <coughs> so right. one of the culminating activities during the rite of passage at puberty, because there, there were other rites of passage, Conception was a rite of passage. Mm-hmm. Birth mm-hmm. was a rite of passage. Okay. Two to three was a rite of passage. Seven to nine. And then so you went through your gradations of life and the spiritual essence. And that's what our children are also suffering mm. from. The spirit is not being addressed in our children. Okay. And so that when the spirit is not addressed in a child, then they will, always, they will never move to the next level. It's like mm-hmm. when you study algebra, geometry, and trigonometry. Okay. Geometry is an outgrowth of algebra. Trigonometry is an outgrowth of geometry. You cannot study trigonometry and not know algebra. Right, exactly. So that in the right. same way, in the rite of passage, there are spirits that are addressed, that introduce this spirit within this person, this ka in ancient Kemet it would be called, into this person. This, it would be addressed, respected, and brought to a certain level of consciousness. Mm-hmm. The idea of removing the foreskin of the young man was the, was the act of the man accepting his manhood. Mm-hmm. The idea of, and what became symbolic excision, yeah, I mean, it wasn't a whole clitoris was removed. It was just a piece was removed. And it, at times, it wasn't even anything removed once they got to realize it. But that, be, that represented the female at accepting her femininity, her female role. Mm-hmm. The brothers, the elder brothers would take the young man out, school him in manhood. The elder sisters would take the young ladies out, school them in womanhood. Mm-hmm. And as she said, those activities that would bring them together, that would titillate them, that would get them excited, but would teach them Control. discipline. Mm-hmm. Yes, you're going to get these feelings, but you've got to hold on. What we have in our communities today, I have caught children in stairways having sex right. in junior high school. Yeah. 
See, they know me because I used to always walk the stairway. So they know stay uh -huh. off exit 10 because that's where Brother Booker is. Because <laughs> I walked it. And, and the first question that I would say, I've caught them having oral sex. Mm -hmm. Well, let's be real because mm -hmm. this is what the problem is. We're not talking about these issues. Okay. My first thing with the young brothers, do you have a condom? Not that they work. But if you're going to be acting like this on the staircase, are you protecting yourself? Are you aware of what you're doing? Are you ready to pay for this young lady's baby if it, you get her pregnant? Mm -hmm. Does her mother know that you're on the, uh, in, on the staircase doing this? Mm -hmm. This is what's happening. And that is because the children don't have a sense of self-concept. Because what I tell the sister, if you understood how sacred your temple is, and brother, if you understood how sacred your reproductive organ is, you wouldn't put it in every hole you come upon. Mm. No self-concept no idea what's going on. You would care for your body a different way if you understood it. And African folk teach their children about their bodies. And so therefore, these other things, whether it be your sexual preference or whether it be the drugs you put in your body, mm -hmm. the people you associate with, the things that you do, all come out of a self-concept. And mm. see, this is what Professor, again, I go back to what Professor Clark did for me as a young man of 12 and a half, at these moments of raging hormones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He caught me at a most opportune time. Right. He at taught 12. me right. what oh. the zipper was on my pants for. He taught me how to conduct myself, mm. how to be a man, and what to expect for in the ladies that I associate with. These were the kind of conversations that this brother would have. I would love to tell you I saw him every day, I hung up, but I didn't. But in those moments, that I did meet with him. We had these kinds of conversations. He mm -hmm. would ask me how my grades were doing. He'd ask me how I was doing. This is what we need to do with our children. Don't be afraid of them. Ask mm -hmm. them, what's, what, right. what's, what's right. going on? How'd you do on your report card last right. time? Right. How you doing in school? Mm -hmm. What are you eating these days? Right. Mm -hmm. right. You know, right. these are the little things that if you just, and they want to tell us. Mm -hmm. They just look hard because they're hurt. The hardest heart equals the hardest hurt. Mm. And what Professor Clark did, he touched my spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we need to touch our children's spirit. Amen. You mentioned his family. Um, I started going to Columbus, Georgia with him mm. in 1991. Okay. I didn't realize it was so long. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he would go home, he would be down there at two weeks before the holidays, the Christmas yeah. holidays. Mm. I would go after the holidays because I was here with my family. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and since his past, I still go down every... You still go down? I still oh, go yeah. down yeah. every day. That's and right. if I don't, as a matter of fact, they started ca calling me from September to find if I'm coming. Right? That's fabulous. But um, he loved his family unconditionally, including mm -hmm. his two children. He loved them. Yeah. unconditionally and family to him was paramount in his life Whatever well let's hear what uh, dr clark has to say about family family okay go ahead it's in vtr1 this is our closing piece and we'll be right back at you it's a short one it's only about four minutes all right uh, vtr1 the second half many perceive the african-american family as an endangered species to Dr. Clark, the family is the soul, the spirit, and the cornerstone of the nation. If the family dies, so does the nation. We're making a whole new way of life out of the artificiality of imitating our oppressor, who's also in trouble with the family. And we grew up in communities where every child was a child of the whole community and could be disciplined and rewarded by anyone in the community. Now we bought into someone else's sociology. Don't touch that child. Don't you dare spank my child. Conformly, your mother left you alone. Said, if they misbehave, you, you can spank them. We don't have that kind of relationship one to the other anymore. After emancipation, we made a monumental effort to find broken bits and pieces of our family. My own grandmother spent three years wandering around Virginia trying to find her first husband who had been sold to a slave breeding farm in Virginia. But the major thing was we were trying to put families together and to have family connections. 
our new mission of liberation is to put strong families together again because the family is not only the embryo, the beginning of all that we can call civilization, but it's the beginning of all anyone can call a civilization. Because this is the essential network that leads to nation. There's some common sense things we can still be doing. Our communities are miniature nations. We have to control them. Control the real estate in those communities. Control the education in those communities. You cannot write the history of this nation as though it is only a white nation. It's a multicultural nation. I'm saying whatever the solution is, either we are in charge of our own destiny, or we are not in charge. On that point, we got to be clear. You're either free or you're a slave. Ah, <laughs> either you're free or you're a slave. Did he put it amply or what? As normal? Huh? He, he just has a way of putting things that are only he could do. I recommend uh, everyone see this film. It's called The Great and Mighty Walk. Uh, the producer is Wesley Snipes. Well done, Wesley. Tell us about anything you want to say, Mrs. Clark. Well, in his early life, he'll tell you how he got the books. Mm -hmm. And he liberated the books. People were not using them. But at age 83, when he left us, or he made his transition, Prior to that, 10 years before, he had gifted his works, his books, mm -hmm. the largest portion, and we estimate about 40,000 books, 40, to Clark Atlanta University. Oh, that's what they are. It oh, is great. now in the Woodruff Library Center, and it's now been transported from the, the floor down below to the upstairs floor, and it's now a research library okay. where it's controlled because there were some problems with safeguarding the books. Mm -hmm. And um, that he left as a legacy for all of us. And my I, suggestion is students who are studying and who want to know the history, you access the information at that research library because it is there. It was intention, his intention that it be a repository of knowledge for the kind of knowledge he couldn't get and he had to go searching for all right. over the world. Right. And he's left it there across, he wants it to be used for students across the diaspora. Okay. So that is his legacy. And I hope the young people and whoever is listening will take advantage of that gift that he left. Wow. Unstintingly, he gave it as a gift without any monetary consideration. Amen. My grandson just started Clark. Yes. Great. <laughs> this September. Great. Great. He just started Clark Atlanta. Fabulous. Ah, man, what a show. It's just, uh, it's, it's warming uh, to just talk about uh, this giant of a man. Any closing remarks? Uh, one thing I remember about Professor Clark <clears throat> is because of my awe of him. He was what I would consider my intellectual father. Mm -hmm. I had parents, wonderful parents. Uh, they gave me all the things I needed to do as a young man, all the things I needed to be. But I remember that Professor Clark, in, in, in our awe of him, sitting at his feet and listening to him speak and things like that, I remember there were times when he would, after the presentation and we'd be walking somewhere, he'd say, you know, Booker T, there's going to come a time when I don't want you around. Mm. He said, because there's a time when if I've really done my job, mm -hmm. you're going to be out there doing what I'm doing. So he uh, said, don't okay. get caught up in what he, what, 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 what he called like, um, um, like when you honor somebody to the point where they become your savior. Because he ah, understood that right, his power, right, you know, right. and he understood that his, his pull, his magnetism was such that people would be drawn to him. But he often said, you know, he, you know, he often re you know, reminded us um, uh, that if, mm. if I'm doing my job right, there's going to come a time when you're not supposed to be around me, that I've so impacted you on what you do, you're going to want to do for others what I've done for you. 
And this was the kind of individual that he was because he could have had us always around him in t total awe of him and hanging on every word, which we did when we were around him. And I'm speaking not just of myself, but all of the other people that he's had such a strong impact on. I am one of many, many, many hundreds, if not thousands, mm -hmm. of people who have directly or indirectly been mm -hmm. impacted by him. He called it a Messiah complex. Mm. Right. Uh, there were right. things that I remember him saying, I think Messiah complex right. was one, ego starvation was another. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, when you are Dependence doing what you're... Dependency deprivation. Say it again, please. Dependency deprivation. Yes, yes. Another one is. Yeah, I mean, these are little things that I remember. And then, of course, his quote that mm. I will never forget, that I always even say to children. I bring his big picture, a big picture, and I just put it there, and I say, this mm -hmm. is my teacher. Mm -hmm. And this is what right. he said. He said that history was a clock that people used to tell their political right. time of day. Right. And that history was a compass that people used to find themselves on the right. map of human geography. Right. And on, with, with those two concepts, you can understand how history builds. When I teach my classes, there are two things that I start with. I start with geography and history. Mm -hmm. Geography sets the students in, in space. History tells them the time. When you ground a person in time and space, you can take them anywhere, teach them anything, and they can take it to another level. Mm. And this comes out of the teachings of Professor Clark. Amen. And I say, let's keep on keeping on. Amen. There's going to be a number at the end of this program, uh, we have a few minutes left, uh, where if you want to keep up with the teachings that we're trying to present to you on this program, uh, there are many more to come, because you've seen uh, uh, Booker T before, and you, you'll see many, much of um, uh, Miss Sybil uh, Williams Clark, much more. I believe we, we should do a series of Dr. Clark, now, all right? And uh, I think we should get this teaching. Uh, his method of teaching and the information that he had for us all. You know, it's good to see that he has it down there at Clark University. So my grandson can hopefully he'll take advantage of all this. Yeah, you and know, the and students who are on the Who taught you to hate the color of your skin? Something here in New York, though. Oh, who yeah. taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself? from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. No, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate? You should ask yourself, who taught you to hate being what God gave you? Most of us blacks, or Negroes as he called us, really thought we were free without being aware that in our subconscious all those chains we thought had been struck off were still there. And there were many ways where what really motivated us, motivated us was our desire.